when an inquirer about Zen came to a master, often, you know, they approach a Zen master with a kind of key question. What is the fundamental principle of Buddhism? Or why did the bearded barbarian come from the West? Because Zen is supposed to have been brought into China by a Hindu named Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma is always represented as having a huge bushy beard and very fierce eyes. Now, Bodhidharma always insisted that he had nothing to teach. And so, why did he come? That's one of the fundamental questions. You might say to me, I've often said uh, when I'm giving a lecture, I'm not trying to improve you. I'm not trying to uh, persuade you to a certain point of view. That is to say, like a preacher would convert somebody. In fact, I have nothing to tell you at all. Because were I to presume that I had something to tell you, I would be like a person who picked your pocket and sold you your own watch. So you might say, then, why do I talk? You might ask the sky, why are you blue? The clouds, why do you float around? Birds, why do you sing? And we've been busy trying to invent explanations for all this. And so there's this great Zen saying, one of the old masters said, when I was a young man and knew nothing of Buddhism, mountains were mountains and waters were waters. But when I began to understand a little Buddhism, mountains were no longer mountains and waters no longer waters. In other words, when one starts scientific and philosophical inquiries, everything gets explained away in terms of its causes or other things that go with it. Or one sees that all the things in the world, what we think are separate things, are as things illusions. There is nothing separate. So, but he said at the end, but when I had thoroughly understood, mountains were mountains and waters are waters. So, this is what's called direct pointing. A Zen master was once talking with me, and he said, when water goes out of the wash basin, down the drain, does it go clockwise or anti-clockwise? <laughs> and this was all phrased in the middle of a very ordinary conversation, and, you know, it just seemed like a speculative question. And I said, oh, it might go either. He said, no, like this. Now he said, which came the first, egg or hen? I said, tuk, 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 tuk. <laughs> now, he said, that's the point. <laughs> now, it is saying too much, I warn you, to say that Zen is trying to point to the physical universe so that you can look at it without forming ideas about it. That is saying too much, but it is the general idea. It's in the direction of being the right idea. Zen people speak of the virtue of what they call mushin, which means no mind, or munen, no thought. That red lantern says munen on it, no thought. This is not an anti-intellectual attitude. The ordinary simple person is just as bamboozled by thinking as a university professor. You can think intellectually in a no-think way. That's the art. It doesn't mean not to have any thoughts at all. It means not to be fooled by thoughts not to be hypnotized by the forms of speech and uh, images that we have for the world 
not to be hypnotized by them into thinking that that is the way the world really is. So if I say this is a fan, it isn't. To begin with, fan is a noise. And this doesn't make the noise fan, but just whoosh. But it can be many other things than a fan. It could be a back scratcher. Very well. All sorts of things. Don't let words limit the possibilities of life. Actually, this fan has an inscription on it written by a Zen master who is a hundred years old. And it says, I don't understand, I don't know anything about it. So that goes back to the story of Bodhidharma, that when he first came to China, sometime a little before 500 AD, he was interviewed by the Emperor Wu of Liang. The Emperor was a great patron of Buddhism and said, we have caused many monasteries to be built, monks and nuns to be ordained, and the scriptures to be translated into Chinese. What is the merit of this? And Bodhidharma said, no merit whatever. Well, that really set the emperor back because the popular understanding of Buddhism is that you do good things like that, re religious things, and you acquire merit. And this leads you to better and better lives in the future so that you will eventually become liberated. And so his, he was completely set back. So he said, well, what is the first principle of the holy doctrine? And Bodhidharma said, vast emptiness and nothing holy. Or in vast emptiness, there is nothing holy. So the emperor said, who is it then that stands before us? The implication being, aren't you supposed to be a holy man? And Bodhidharma said, I don't know. So the poem says, plucking flowers to which the butterflies come, Bodhidharma says, I don't know. And another poem like it, if you want to know where the flowers come from, even the god of spring doesn't know. So anybody who says that he knows what Zen is, is a fraud. Nobody knows. Just like you don't know who you are. All this business about your name and your accomplishments, your certificates, what your friends say about you, you know very well that's not you. But the problem to know who you are is the problem of smelling your own nose. When the great Japanese master Dogen came back from China in about the year 1200 to bring his school of Zen into Japan, they asked him, what did you learn in China? He said, the eyes are horizontal, the nose is perpendicular. <laughs> this man went on to write a tremendous book about Zen. They're so contradictory, these people. Don't expect consistency out of a Zen master. Big, big book called the Shobo Genzo. I talked with the Zen master about this book in Japan. And he said, oh, he said, that's a terrible book. It explains everything so clearly. <laughs> it gives the show away. He said, you don't need any book for Zen. So you see, it is this kind of way of going about things, this method of Zen, that has so fascinated the West. And everybody who, who reads about Zen wonders if somehow, you see, this understanding is right under your nose. You know how it is sometimes you get a crowd of people to come into a room and you put something in the room that's absurd. Like, suppose there was a balloon floating on the ceiling. People could come in and not notice it at all. 
or uh, you know somebody puts on something weird, some kind of a funny necktie or something, and you say to a person, well, haven't you noticed? <laughs> a woman in a new dress, you know? Haven't you noticed? You said, well, no, what, what, what is it? What, 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 what? You know, it's right under your nose. They're staring you in the face, but you don't see it. And Zen is exactly like that. It is very obvious. The master Bokuju was asked, we have to dress and eat every day, and how do we escape from all that? In other words, how do we get out of routine? And he said, we dress, we eat. He said, I don't understand. Bokuju said, if you don't understand, put on your clothes and eat your food. <laughs> Another Zen master in quite recent times was interviewing a student. You see, all these stories I'm telling you are connected, and what I want you to do is to grasp intuitively the connection. I was uh, interviewing a student, Western student, and he said, um, get up and walk across the room. He got up and walked and came back. He said, where are your footprints? Another monk asked Joshu, what is the way? Tao in Chinese, the Tao. He said, your everyday mind is the way. How do you get into accord with it? He said, when you try to accord, you deviate. 